Okay, everyone, here we go. So we're still in the Stone Age, and we're going to get a little bit into the Metal Age, if you will, or the Bronze Age. Um, but we get to the second half of the Stone Age, which is the Neolithic, which is very important because this typical historians say this is when civilization begins. Now, civilization is really subjective, and our thoughts on the word itself have resulted in massive conflict for thousands of years. So you do kind of need to watch your step with that word. But, so... We've learned about the agricultural revolution, its positives and negatives, and we did have a little bit of a blog entry about that. And it's time to check out how we lived during this early period, okay? Many um, historians tell us we don't have civilization yet, even though we're just in cities, although I do beg to differ on that. But the foundation for much of our civilization was established during the Neolithic time period. Many technological advances were created that put us on our path. So technically, many historians say we don't have civilization yet because we don't might not have a common language or we're not writing stuff down. But in my opinion, if we're all living in cities and people are working together, what's not civilized about that? And furthermore, even though people might be wandering around looking for food still because you have just as many hunter-gatherers as city folk, I don't know, I think there's civilization too. So let's check it out. Okay, so you've learned a lot already about agriculture. Okay, that's great. We're not going to rehash that film. But what you do need to know are the people who did the agriculture. And as at least as the timeline goes right now, it's the Natufians. I don't have any pictures because we don't. Um, we believe the oldest sites where we have found agricultural tools and things like that are in modern-day Israel and Lebanon. You see the map over here. Let's look at the mouse. Yay! Okay, and all of these red sites. Um, uh, this was a great place to grow stuff from 13... And a half thousand to about 15,000 years ago, so that's a long time ago. And the things that we see there are wheat, barley, and then the domestication of sheep, goats, pigs, and cattle. Now, again, these are important things to know. This could be up on a test and things along that line. But other than that, it's also good to know, like, what were we eating? Um, and we also develop the question, did we domesticate wheat or did wheat domesticate us, which is very interesting, and we'll talk about that in class. Now, other areas around the world, independent of this, that were relatively close, you have the Jomon over in Japan about 10,500 years ago. They created buckwheat, which is not the same as wheat, as well as fishing. In modern-day Nigeria, the Bantu, who were older than the Egyptians, by the way, older, older, important to know, um, 8,000 plus years ago, we have yam, okra, peas, and sorghum. And then in the, uh, and then in China, you have two river valleys, the Yangtze, which is 6,500 years ago, which we have rice, sorghum, and pigs. And in the Yellow River, about 5,500 years ago, rice, millet, soy, and they were the first to domesticate chickens. Uh, and then Mesoamerica, which is Central America, finally our area of the world, when people first started settling down corn, which was by and large the most important, beans, peppers, squash, tomatoes, and then llamas and, and potatoes are probably the biggest one. And in Southeast Asia, we've got taro, coconuts, banana, and citrus. It's in the notes, just, you know, kind of pay attention to it, okay? Now, unfortunately, and this is going to be a big issue moving forward, the Americas. Um, if you notice, the only animal I mentioned was the llama, and that's not good. We, we over here do not have anything other than the llama, and that just isn't any good. Um, we're going to be talking about that more as we move forward, and here's like a hipster llama. Um, but that's going to cause lots and lots of problems. Now, here's also a map, and you can pause this and take a look at it. This really kind of uh, gives you these red areas that are some really focal spots, which you can see. So, hey, up in the America, we got squash. If you like squash, not a fan of squash, but if you like it, it's good. And all these other areas. So please take a look at this map because this is stuff that you're going to need to know. Now, one of the big things here is the fact of the matter is with centralized agriculture, as John Green's video mentioned, you are able to have people do other stuff. And because we have more food, more people. It's that simple, okay? To give you an idea, our estimated numbers, and you can look at this in the notes, 
By around 3000 BCE, we're looking at about 14 million people on the planet, which is less than Jersey. Um, but within 2,500 years, that number will grow to 100 million. And so, so before we get to the year zero, if you will, we'll go from 14 to 100 million and we'll still continue to grow all the way to the, what do I think we're at like 7 billion now? It's like ridiculous. Now, the big difference here is with stable agriculture, we start building cities. And the oldest city that we found to date, although there's some questions that we're going to get into, is Katal Hoyuk, which was discovered in modern-day Turkey. And this is actually a picture of people um, excavating Katal Hoyuk. And here is what we think it looked like. Um, you're looking at a city anywhere from 10 thousand plus years ago. We think it actually operated um, for about 2,000 years. So look at it this way. This city, which has been gone, okay, gone for 2,500 years, still has existed much longer than that, or had existed much longer than that. We think about 5,000 people there. Um, not very planned community. We're not seeing streets and things like that, but 5,000 people, you can call it a city. There's no doubt. And that is going to be a huge shift. Although you need to understand, it takes really until the mid-1800s for more humans to live in cities than in rural areas, okay? So for much of history, that's going to be the case of people living in rural areas. Now, the timeline, however, is getting a little bit messed up. Now, this is something I'm going to introduce and we're going to talk about more later. If you see here, you see this guy underwater here? Okay, this is expeditions going on in an area known as Dwarka, D-W-A-R-K-A. Dwarka itself is actually a city. This is the... Um, little lighthouse-y thing right here. Um, that is an ancient Indian city. The city that is above water is four or 5,000 years old. However, what we have started to discover under the water are these ancient cities, okay? Dwarka being one. And we think it looked like something here on the right. Now, why this is very important is that we say that humans started to get into cities, you know, about, you know, eight to 10,000 years ago, and then we start to, you know, develop civilization after that. However, based on models of the last ice age and when this area would have been on land, because obviously we're not building water or we're not building under the water, this city would be around 15,000 years old. So that is throwing all sorts of new things into, into the timeline and really starting to challenge stuff and stuff that we are going to talk about quite deeply in class. Now, because we have all of this food going on, we've got specialization, okay? With a food surplus, people unlike hunter-gatherers, don't have to be dedicated to finding food. So what do we got going on? You've got all sorts of different people from servants or sometimes slaves, craftsmen, artists, warriors. You have a role of government because if you see people building stuff and you have a city, somebody's in charge. It might be an informal government, and that's okay, but you still have a government and will eventually get the development of kings. Remember, democracy, very, very new. Most people who have ever lived in a civilization in the entirety of history were ruled by some type of king. Although priests, very important and going to play a large role moving forward. Now, also during this time period, we get the development and the use of metal. Somebody somewhere saw something shiny, because humans love things that are shiny, we'll discuss, and in a rock and decided for whatever reason to melt it. Just like the same guy that decided to mess around with fire. Well, turns out if you melt the metal out of rocks, it tends to be better than stone. And the first one was copper. The second one was tin. Now, copper and tin are used really, really well. Um, and you can do lots of stuff with them. However, both copper and tin are, um, they are soft. So 
Yeah, you could make a knife or even maybe a spear, but it would dull very, very quickly. However, some genius, don't know who it was, was able to actually mix copper and tin to create bronze. That metal was much harder, could be used for weapons to devastating effect. And if we look at some of our earliest societies in both the Middle East and ancient Africa, much of them were built on bronze, okay? And bronze also lasts a lot longer as well. This makes stronger tools. You can use it to make better plows and stuff like that. Metal game changer. And a game changer today. Look at all the things that we have that are metal and how much it's benefited us today. Now, we also have, I have here jobs, but we also have like early industry, whether it is tool making, pottery making, which is huge because you need to store stuff in things. There is no Tupperware or Rubbermaid, and textiles. We actually think textiles um, were also a way that people could show their wealth, which is always tied to the land, but it's no different today. The wealthy wear nicer clothes. However, the first industry in the world is pottery and the mass creation of pottery. And we actually think people worked for potterers um, on a mass scale. So not mass production yet, but pretty big deal. Uh, the other big thing we see back in ancient, ancient times is trade. Now, we talked a little bit about the Venus figurines already, but trade is crucial um, because it is based on this idea of scarcity, okay? And the idea of scarcity, and I don't have it written down here, but I want you to understand this, guys. Scarcity is the idea that we have in unlimited amounts of wants and needs, okay? And the thing in why trade is crucial is that we don't have enough stuff to provide for all those wants and needs. Now, scarcity is a big economic thing, but as you're going to see, economics run stuff. So if I need something, I'm going to try to find it, okay? And that's why trade is such a big deal. Now, the big thing is access, okay? Because most of the stuff of trade is going to be crops. Now, we can either go to an east-west or a north-south if you're looking at the map. Now, as you see here, Afro-Eurasia, Afro this area right here, is huge for trade. Why? The most common thing that was traded is crops because we see food show up in places where it didn't start. Wheat goes from here and works its way across. Rice works its way back. Cotton starts kind of in the middle and works its way either spot. So we know the food was being traded, but here's the thing. Remember, our climate is typically determined by our longitude, or sorry, our latitude, which is east and west of the equator. So, or I'm sorry, east and west, but north and south longitude, I was correct the first time. So the higher up, more cold. In the middle, you have the tropics, south, more cold. So the reason what you have here is there's so much trade because it's easier because you have a crop that's grown right here where this mouse is. If I go right over here, the crop's going to be able to grow there as well. North America doesn't have a lot of trade because the way that everything was, it was a more north-south. Potatoes that were grown here actually couldn't be grown over here, so no dice on trade. We also know that you had to trade, and that was because of metal, and when we see bronze, now the reason for that is that copper and tin are not present in the same places in the earth. They are not found in the same mountains. So you had to get copper and tin from different places. As a result, we know you have trade. And of course, we have social distinction and culture, and this is very important. Land equals power. It's really not any different today that those that controlled the land had the power, and as a result, you had to have a government. Large amounts of people require a government to work. Whether you agree with governments or not, if you don't have somebody running the show, it doesn't work. Now, there is no writing in this Neolithic time period, so we're still not 100% sure of how these governments might have worked. Um, but somebody had to be in charge, especially because we're going to see like large building projects and other things along that line. And that takes a certain level of organization. We're going to see fields that have been created evenly. We're going to see some early irrigation, which I'll get to. So all of those things easily require organization 
and government. We do think people had to operate by some type of calendar just to... Um, just to be able to function because you had to know when to grow the crops. I'm not saying they have like, you know, a cool Hello Kitty wall car calendar, you know, maybe a One Direction if you're into that. But nonetheless, you have to have a calendar. It doesn't work. So they had to have had a way to keep track of the seasons. And we also know religion was very important. We see all those little figurines. We see the Venus figurines all the way from Africa to Asia. We see them all over the place. And so we know that religion was important for these groups as well. Okay, so we have a lot of stuff going on, and despite the, the, the fact that people want to say there's no civilization at this time, I would highly disagree. All right, so make sure you're taking your notes and you're keeping aware of stuff. We're going to talk in class tomorrow. Make sure we check our calendar.